What's up guys, today Dirt Lifestyle, we're gonna take a driver's side drop axle and turn it into a passenger side drop axle. We have a bunch of fab work involved, it's gonna be a lot of fun, so we need to get started. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it is raining like crazy out there. It's pushing a bunch of rain in here. <laughs> so, hopefully you'll be able to hear me and ignore that sound in the background. Um, I have been doing a bunch of layout on this axle. I'm going to have to trim away some of this housing in order to give us enough room to work with here. The way they did these Super Duty 60s, there's not a whole lot of room on the driver's side. So you can see the weld right here. This is what holds the tube into the housing. So we're really far away from that. We're gonna be just fine. We're gonna cut this bad boy here. We're gonna cut it in the same location on the other side to make it easier to swap these two sides. The first thing that we need to do before we make any of these cuts and chip away this, this cast steel is make lots of measurements and I have been doing that. So I just drew a little, I mean you can see my public school drawing here. <laughs> and I just took measurements basically. So I took measurements, this is where everything needs to end up once we're all done and we're welding everything back together. I've got this little angle finder that I got on Amazon and I've checked it multiple times. This thing's actually very accurate. And I'm just getting a measurement down in here. Point, so it's a third of a degree right now off of zero. And I did notice the two sides are slightly different OEM, which is not a problem. Believe it or not, you have more of a margin for error here than you would expect. A degree or more is a problem, but anything less than a half degree, see, and this, this is great because I did all those measurements and everything last night and it says 0.0, .0 meaning that this is reading the exact same as it was last night, which is an indicator that it's accurate. <laughs> So this side is zero, that other one was like what, 0.3 or 0.4 or something like that. So these are all things that I'm writing down on that piece of paper and this is where these need to end up once we're all done. And of course, I'm taking different measurements on the housing and just making sure that once it's time to weld it back up, we can straighten this back out to the, exactly where it was before we cut it into pieces. I know a lot of people are intimidated by a job like this, but I think that once you watch the process being done, you're very quickly gonna realize that complicated fabrication jobs are just like simple fabrication jobs. You need a creative mind, you need basic fabrication tools. Everything that you're gonna see me use today can be found in an average fabrication shop. We're gonna be using a welder, we're gonna be using an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel, and we're gonna be using an angle finder. Way more room without that casting there. So I've got it cut evenly on both sides, and now I made two marks. It's gonna be very simple. Five inches, if I'm cutting five inches over here, then I need to cut five inches over here because what we're literally doing is flopping these two sides. So what I'm gonna do is trace this around. I've got a couple different methods to do this. I've got this pipe wrap, which works great, um, but the pipe wrap isn't gonna fit on the small side. So I'm gonna use emery cloth. This is a trick I did back when I was a plumber. So I'll just take the emery cloth. I'm gonna run it all the way around and then I'll trace it with this. Then I'm gonna break out the porta band and cut this bad boy. got this axle housing all cleaned up it is time for the fun part reassembly so I'm gonna take this inner C we need to get it to reconnect here this is something that could just be butt welded but uh, what I want to do is use sleeves these inner sleeves are gonna make it way easier to line everything back up and these are not to add strength I guess technically it would add strength this is for alignment as far as I'm concerned so what I did is I got the measurements online of the inner diameter of this axle housing and then I searched around online for a chunk of material that was gonna be slightly bigger so I could have it turned down to the exact size that I needed. I think this was like 2.83, I don't remember the exact measurements, but the inner diameter was bigger than two and three quarters, so I know that tube was out of the question. I was gonna need to find pipe. Pipe is measured on its inside diameter and it gives you really goofy outside diameters. Luckily, two and a half inch pipe ends up being just barely bigger than the inside diameter of this tube here. So what I did is I took it to a buddy that had a machine shop and he machined this down for me. And uh, thank you very much, Rubber Ducky TJ, you are the man. <laughs> so he machined this down for me with a lathe. A lathe is a very common tool. You don't have to have all the machining tools yourself in order to get good machine work done. Um, you can build housings like this without everything you need. If you have a really cheap, 110 welder, you could tack this all together, get it exactly where you want it, and you can take it to somebody with a good welder to finish weld it for you. And I use that same principle with this. I don't have a lathe, but I went and I bought $20 in a pipe, 
I took it to a buddy with a lathe and he hooked me up. The next step is gonna be cut it down. I gave him just a generic measurement. I said, give me a couple at uh, eight inches. And then once I get this uh, all stripped apart, I can figure out exactly what the right length is gonna be. The right length for me is gonna be like five and a half inches. So I'm gonna use this Evolution power saw. And I'm gonna cut these bad boys down. <laughs> it a little bit easier to slide this sleeve in, I decided to polish up the inside of the axle housing with this valve grinding compound. This is for engine work. If you're doing a cheap rebuild, you can uh, polish the in underside of all your valves instead of taking it to a machine shop just by basically spinning the valve around real fast with this compound. This compound is gritty and it helps to smooth things out. What I did is I put a little bit of this on the inside of each one of the surfaces that I needed to slide that sleeve through. And then I, I buffed it out really good with this, this wire brush, which happens to fit just perfectly on the inside of that housing. So I, I buffed it all out really nice and shiny and smooth. And then uh, I cleaned it up and then I sprayed it with some anti-spatter spray. I wanted to put some sort of a lubricant to help this all slide together. And WD-40 isn't something you want to weld over, but you can weld over anti-spatter spray. That's what it's made for. So I coated the insides of all the surfaces with the anti-spatter spray and, uh, you know, pressed it all together and tapped it with mallets and just kind of worked on it. Now I'm gonna cheat. I didn't know this was gonna be an option for me, but I got an alignment rod. So this is a long chromoly rod that slides into a series of four pucks. And these four pucks will be placed throughout the housing. We've got one machine fit over here, one machine fit over here, and then two in the center. And the clearance between the inside of this and the outside of the rod is super tight, like a thousandth or two. So this makes it to where as you are lining everything up and you start welding on it, it helps to keep things from warping. Um, I'm cheating. Originally I was gonna do it without using this, but I would be crazy not to do it with it. My buddy who uh, machined these little sleeves for me, he happened to have an alignment set up that he made for a Super Duty Dana 60. So I said, hell yeah, I'll use it. And so you're gonna be seeing me use that today too. I've got this dialed in. Let's take a peek here. We got this side at zero. Let's go check the other side. I wanted to just put them both at zero just to make things easy and consistent. So I'm hoping this one stays. There's 030. And will it? Let me make sure it is centered in there. Oh, there we go. Now it's centered. To me, half a degree margin. There we go. It's zero. Half a degree margin is acceptable, but that is like, <laughs> that is zero on both sides. So those are definitely even. And we are at six degrees. So when this axle is level, when this pinion is level, it's gonna make these inner C's at six degrees. That is, I mean, very, very, very close to stock. It says 6.4. Um, and the digit that I wrote down before was 6.1. So we're actually, gaining just a touch of pinion angle, maybe like a third of a degree <laughs> of pinion angle. But the way it sets right now should be more than acceptable. The only other two measurements we need to check are gonna be with a tape measure. And we need eight and 15 sixteenths. That sure looks like eight and 15 sixteenths to me. And then we need 31 and three sixteenths. And uh, these, actually these measurements, we have quite a bit of margin for error, but I mean, we are dead nuts on. That's 31 and 3 sixteenths, and that's exactly what I've written down here. It's 31 and 3 sixteenths. So this bad boy is ready to get tacked up. Got everything tacked into place and all the measurements look great i just triple checked everything and we are we are definitely sitting pretty 
So I wanna build a truss on this and I want to get the truss on before we finish weld because I think it's gonna be a third layer, a third barrier of protection if you would, to keep this from warping as we weld. We're gonna use a few different techniques to keep it from warping as we move along. But before we can fabricate the truss, we need to locate these lower coil buckets because that truss can't be in a place where this bucket needs to be. And I have made this to where it is just enough space to modify this coil bucket and make it work. Doing a job like this is way easier if you have coilovers because you just got to mount two tabs on the bottom there. But I, I don't want to swap the Land Rover over to coilovers in the front just because it's, it's a whole nother can of worms. I can continue to use the suspension style that's on there now and I think we'll get great results. So I'm going to modify a coil bucket for this side and then the other side will be easy. A coil bucket will fit right on there. I did some offset coil buckets to make it easier to stretch the wheelbase a little bit. So this should give us another two inches or so of stretch in the front and that'll make room for our 37 inch tires and keep the tire a little bit farther away from the body. So right now I'm gonna take some measurements on the Land Rover and try to do a little bit of layout and see where these coil buckets are gonna land and, and just see how practical this is gonna be. If you're swapping one tons into something and you don't have like a special bracket kit that's made for like a JK or an XJ or whatever, um, you're gonna be doing what I do. You're gonna be thinking of creative solutions to locate everything. And one thing I recommend you do, send it from one side to the other and mark a center line. So I already made a center line mark here. And now whenever I need to locate things like coil buckets, I go off of the center of the axle instead of trying to find other common things because we wanna center this axle into the center line of the Land Rover. And whenever I do that, if I locate everything based on that center line, then it's all gonna line up perfect. So I've got 38 inches from one coil bucket to the other. That was the measurement on the Land Rover. I divide that in half, I've got 19 inches. And now I can just measure over 19 from this center line mark. And that's where the coil bucket gets located. Super simple. Also, I build everything like it's at ride height. So right now, this is at the pitch and angle and everything that I like. We're at like six and a half degrees ish for these inner seas. And to me, that's like a really good ballpark to keep me from having a death wobble issue. And I've never built anything that's had a death wobble issue just because I've, I've built it all like it's gonna be at ride height. So now as I'm putting all these brackets and stuff on, because it's at ride height, I put this on here, put the angle finder on there, it's zero and it's gonna be money. As you can obviously see, this is gonna end up being a three link front suspension. And before I build this truss, I wanted to mount, oh, ooh, it's kind of mounted, <laughs> just a couple light tack welds. I wanted to mount this upper control arm mount. So the truss is gonna join between these two pieces right here, and then it's gonna go down and then join to this piece right here. And before we get to that point, I do wanna take and weld any of the welds up here that are gonna be hard to reach once the truss is on. I'm gonna be heating up this center section with a double-ended map gas torch. This is something that works really well for this application. It doesn't heat as fast as oxy acetylene torch, but I'm at, out of acetylene. Map gas is way cheaper than acetylene anyways. So I'm gonna slowly heat this up. Once I get it above 300 degrees, I'm probably gonna take the torch, turn it off, and uh, try to TIG weld it. I'm gonna let it cool slowly by uh, periodically taking the torch and hitting it with a little bit more heat for you know 20 or 30 seconds and then pulling it back off. A lot of people will wrap it with a welding blanket and I've done that before, but I've never really seen much of a difference with letting it cool under a blanket and letting it cool without. I have the top part of this truss tacked together and now I just need to fill it in with what I call webbing. So I'm gonna put a layer of webbing in the front, a layer of webbing in the back, and same thing here. I'm gonna use eighth inch. This is usually what I use for all my webbing. Um, I'm gonna be drilling some holes in it using dimple dies in order to strengthen up the webbing a little bit and then give it that cool off-road look that I like.
I'm almost done finished welding this axle and I wanted to stop and kind of show you what the progress looks like. So I'm not gonna weld across here because this just, you know, this is an easy way to warp a housing. You don't want really long welds across. If I did it like little stitches right there, I'd probably be okay, but I don't need it, so I'm not gonna do it. This is gonna be very strong the way it's welded into this truss. So this is extra space for water and dirt and mud and stuff to get out of there. Um, I'm gonna put a piece across here. So I'm gonna box that in probably later on, not today. And then I'm gonna finish a cover pass. I've already done my root pass with a TIG, as you can see. I'm not a great TIG welder, but I can tell that that's got plenty of penetration that's not gonna leak. Um, I don't see any spots that I think are suspect for holes or anything like that. So now I'm about to do my cover pass and I'm just gonna do like inch and a half and then on the backside do inch and a half and then on the bottom do inch and a half and then just slowly stitch it all together. I'm gonna go kind of wide and just feed it a whole bunch of material so it's got a really nice cover and then later on I'll probably just buzz it down smooth with an angle grinder and no one will ever know. If you ask me, what does it look like when a gearhead rock crawler gets into overlanding? I would say this is what it looks like. <laughs> I think it's gonna handle the weight of our little uh, rover lander, no problem. So I wanna go over a couple of things. The alignment rod slid right out. I mean, it was no issue at all. And the clearance in that rod is super tight. I'm very confident that this is really straight. It's, it's so tough to check how straight things are when you have a span that short. If I could have, I would have loved to put the seam over here, but it just wasn't possible with um, how close this center section is over to this side. No big whoop. Um, I did check with a straight edge on the bottom before I put my final weld in. Everything looked just beautiful, but again, it's really tough to tell. The original plan was to use angle iron, go across the joint, you put like three pieces of angle iron, like one piece here, one piece here, one piece there, and then as you're fabricating everything up, um, if it moves, you'd be able to see it in the angle iron. But luckily, I have a good buddy. I've got a buddy who had that alignment rod, and that was just an absolute game changer with how easy this went together. So as much as I would have loved to have shown you guys the other technique, um, I'm thinking I need to either pay someone to manufacture me an alignment bar for future projects or go online and find one because I don't think I'm going to go back to the old way after using the alignment bar. Also, I didn't finish weld a few of these parts here. Any, anywhere that the steel, the mild steel connects to the cast steel, I wanna to talk to a professional welder before I do that because I've never had issues with MIG and I didn't here. I heated it up, I put a little, a little weld of MIG there, no cracks, no problem. But every time I would try to TIG, I could see the crack forming behind as I was TIGging. So I'm either using the wrong tungsten or I'm using the wrong filler, something like that, but in any case, once I'm done, uh, once I put this underneath the Land Rover, I locate the other brackets, I'll finish weld the rest of this and then uh, grind it all smooth and paint it and make it all pretty. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you like one-off fabrication projects like this one, I've got a whole bunch of it planned for this Land Rover. So make sure that you're subscribed to the channel if you aren't already and like the video. If you wanna help support our channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have a Patreon account, we have t-shirts, hats, stickers, all kinds of things like that. And if you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.